do I have an exciting show for you. Many of you that are into the arts probably know that there was a play here a few months ago called Motown the Musical. Well, I have my guest today here that's going to explain about the American music and ha the things that African Americans contributed to the music that we enjoy here in America. And his name is Tyrone Jefferson. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I am so excited you're here because I went to see Motown and it was wonderful. Cool. I bet you've seen it already. No, actually, we're, uh, we haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen it yet, no. but you're going to catch it when it comes back around, right? That's correct. So, as I said in the opening, that our music here in America, we have so many different kinds, but mm -hmm. people fail to realize that the music that we enjoy is rooted from the African music. That's correct. So, tell me, before we even start about talking about that, a little mm -hmm. bit about who you are, because from what I understand that you're very involved in music also. I am. Uh -huh. um, where do you want me to start? From the beginning? <laughs> Where I, like where I was born, or where do you want me to start? Yeah, you give us a short version of the story of you. <laughs> born in New York, raised in Charlotte, went to Lincoln Heights Elementary, Northwest Junior High School, West Charlotte. Uh huh. In 69, 68, 69, they had forced integration. So I was forced to go to a white school, so I graduated from Garinger. Mm -hmm. Then I went to ANT, went into the military, spent four years in the Army. Uh huh. Got out. In Augusta, Georgia, met James Brown, joined his band, stayed there off and on from 1979 through 2000, until he died. Uh -huh. But I got fired a lot because we didn't always see eye to eye. <laughs> but I made musical director off and on uh -huh. and uh, lived in Boston and New York. And that's it. Wow, you've done a lot yeah. in your short lifetime. Yes. <laughs> So let's start talking about sure. the music from the motherland, Africa. Yes. Whenever we think about American music, rock and roll, mm -hmm. R&B, we tend to forget that the roots started in Africa. Mm -hmm. What type of music would you say came from Africa when the slaves came over here? Well, the broad category, I think, would just be communal mm -hmm. music because, you know, West Africans had a certain sound. South Africans had a certain sound. The folks in Kemet and Egypt had a certain sound. And I guess before you had an influx of Islam in North Africa, they also had a certain sound. Mm -hmm. But the one common thread, based on my research, is all of it was based on the community. Mm -hmm. So we had ceremonies for naming a baby. We had ceremonies when someone transitioned. We had a ceremony, you know, just because it was Friday and the, the rivers provided water. You know, we, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. all about nature and uh, very, sort of agnostic, you know. It's just communal. Mm. You had a leader and we say, uh, can I get an amen? Everyone say amen. You know, it, it was that kind of thing, ah, call and response. Uh -huh, uh -huh, That'd be uh -huh. my generic category uh -huh. in, in terms of, you know, type of music. Uh-huh. So from Africa, we have a lot of instruments that we use today that really originated in Africa. What are some of those? Uh, you have the talking drum, like that's that's a talking drum there, uh -huh. where you use the stick and you know make the sound here, but you change the pitch by doing these. Ah. And, and some say that the uh, enslaved folks were able to communicate from plantation to plantation. And this is a thumb piano, or sometimes called a kalimba. Some people may know that from the Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, you know, Maurice oh. Swite was well steeped in, um, you know, the Nubian culture, and he he knew a lot about African instruments. But you know, you have the djembe mm -hmm. or the balafon, which is a pre uh, predecessor to what we may know as the marimba or the vibraphone. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a host of even the banjo. Banjo oh. has an African roots. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, ask anyone in a country in Western Bend. And see, that's the thing that gets me. Sometimes white folks know a lot more about our culture than we do. That is so true. And so they pretty much, I don't want to say stole the banjo, but they sort of did. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say stole it as long as you, you know the history. I mean, you know, if you know the truth, mm -hmm. okay, they play in the banjo now and it's Earl Scruggs and those kind of cats. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We sort of abandon our history. But ah. as long as people acknowledge it, I wouldn't say stole it, let them use it. That's I mean, right. I, don't, I don't play the talking drum, but that comes from Africa. <laughs> you know, I don't care who plays it. So, you know, it's cool. So let's go back and talk about uh, the history of the American music. Yeah. 
when the slaves came over, you had mentioned earlier that they have the call and response, mm -hmm. and that happened when they were in the plantation working. Did they sing those type of songs while they were working? Well, or was that before? No, the, the type of songs you mean in terms of call and response. Uh -huh. I think that's always been a big part of black folks' music. Uh -huh. Rather. They started in West Africa and migrated to Brazil or the Caribbean or Charleston, South Carolina. Uh -huh. So many of them, first they had to no learn a different language because yes. English was not their native tongue. But the laws in this country precluded people from the same tribe from being together so that they wouldn't, you know, all right, we're going to meet down at the river tonight mm -hmm, and, get, mm -hmm. and, and break out. So they made sure they had people from different tribes uh, together. So the only thing they had in common was this sort of learn some common language, broken English, and to make the day go by faster, somebody would lead and the workers would respond. Mm -hmm. Tired of this, <laughs> fast, you know, that kind of thing. So, Like the hymns from the old country church. Absolutely. Yes, do I remember those. Yeah, where are you from? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm born in and you now. here in Charlotte. Okay. <laughs> But that's true. We used, to, we used to have an old folks choir uh -huh. when I was a kid in the early 50s. And um, the guy would just, it was very African. And I didn't appreciate yes. it then. I had to kind of go to schools and learn stuff about us. Uh huh. Uh huh. But the old folks choir would start with this old man. He had to be 100 when I was six years old. And he would just start like. Mm. Yes. Uh, and then, then the, everybody else would just come in, and the harmonies were great. Mm -hmm. None of those people went to music school. Mm -hmm. Couldn't read a lick of music, but they sound great. They really did. And you can't recreate that. It's like the House of Prayer right now. I have a band where cats have uh, advanced degrees in music. Uh -huh. I said, let's try to play like the House of Prayer. That's like trying to get somebody who has a degree in Bach and Beethoven, don't know anything about Brown and House of Prayer. That's you can't so do it. True. You got to grow up and you got to be steeped in the tradition mm -hmm. to give that sound. Mm -hmm. Now, the cats in the House of Prayer, some of them can't read, but they can play anything. Ask any band director here in Charlotte who they prefer to take on the marching band field. Uh -huh. A little kid that can practice all his scales or somebody from the House of Prayer where you can sing at one time and they got it. You're right. You have a good point there. And with that, let's take a short break. Okay. When we come back, we're going to talk about the music after the Civil War. Cool. Okay? Cool. It's not his new group of friends. It's not the video games. It's not the neighborhood. Mom. Do I have to go to school today? The biggest threat to your child's future could be you. Every day they miss, even in middle school, puts their graduation at risk. saying a word they can tell you so much like someone is having a stroke know the sudden signs learn fast f face drooping a arm weakness s speech difficulty t time time to call 911 immediately the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Learn the body language, the sudden signs, and spot a stroke fast. Welcome back to A Better You. I'm your host, Cynthia Thompson. I'm here with Tyrone, and we are having such a good time talking about music, and we're just getting started. Cool. We started with the slaves when they came over here. Mm -hmm. And what happened after the Civil War with American music? Well... I, I, let me let me jump back and say okay. I think black folks music is always a reflection of where we are in huh. society. Good point. So if the first slaves came over here and they really weren't slaves, I mean they they were indentured servants, many of them. Well, you know, yes. slavery kind of kind of evolved later on. But each time, you know, you have blacks who were classically trained. Remember, there were some who could just pick up an instrument or just hear something uh -huh. one time and play it. I think there's a, a guy named um, 
uh, I know his name is Tom, and I hate to sound stereotypic, but uh, he, was a, a, he was a blind guy, and I'll have to get the name and send it to you, but he could hear any piece one time and mm. play it. Now, wow. white folks realized they could make some money from this brother. You know, he was, a, he was an enslaved African, but because they could make money, they'd have these little parlors in their little, I guess, southern mansions and try to show, showcase their little blind Tom, whatever his name was, mm-hmm. I forgot. And uh, so he could pick anything up. So, but now to ask your question about the Civil War, that was also a, uh, a period in our time where we were divided. Right. Because now think about it. If your grandparents were enslaved, that's mm-hmm. all you knew as a kid, your mother and your father were enslaved, mm-hmm. you're enslaved, now here comes along, uh, Abraham Lincoln was forced to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. It wasn't like he wanted to do that. He's trying to save his union. But that aside, mm-hmm. black folks were accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Freedom had started, started to elude them mm-hmm. to a point. So the music that they were playing was still this little plantation thing. Mm-hmm. And we found solace on Sundays in the church. Uh-huh, Camp uh-huh. meetings and all that, you know, the, the line message, the hymn. You know, we found solace in that. But um, so after the Civil War, once freedom occurred, you had black folks understanding for the first time, I'm free. But what does that mean? What does it mean? What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. You know, I've been working in the field. My grandfather worked in the field. My children work in the field. Where am I going to go? Uh-huh. So Carter G. Wilson says in his book, you know, uh, when blacks realized they were free, some were joyous in the beginning. And then they realized, wait a minute, they start going to the back door. Master, look here, I, the old ones, you know. I think I'll stay here on the plantation because I'm kind of old. I don't know anything else to do. Mm-hmm. So the music that those folks played or listened to was still plantation stuff. Now, the younger folks uh-huh. probably left the plantation, went to larger cities, started assimilating into larger societies, you know, especially when you look at New Orleans society, where they said that was a sort of an influx of both French, African, Spanish, mm-hmm. English, a melting pot of sounds. But when they closed Storyville, now I'm jumping a little bit because um, my time frame may be out in terms of the Civil War to address your question. But folks started going up to Mississippi, going into other cities. Uh-huh. They learned the, the mores and cultures of these other cities along the Mississippi River. They picked that up. And that's how we started getting the, the, uh, the, this jazz, mm-hmm. you know, idiom. And a lot of people so, think jazz is an African word as well, J-A-S-S. So, so do you think the jazz music was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, in that area, or up north? What do you think? I can tell you what I took in school. I took a course at Harvard when I was in Boston during the summer when it was free, you had to be smart to get in. And uh, the guy says, jazz has its birth in New Orleans, uh-huh. Congo Square. Uh-huh. And once they had a little red light district that was closing called Storyville. Mm-hmm. And uh, because you can explain what, to your audience what red light district means later. Uh, uh, no, we won't, <laughs> no, no, no. And uh, <laughs> so musicians started getting on those steamboats going between New Orleans and Chicago and making stops along the way. And King Oliver, had a group, you know, and what people call Dixieland music was really called collective improvisation, kind of going back to the African roots huh. of the communal music. Mm-hmm. So white folks, again, call it Dixieland. So you have a trumpet and a clarinet and, you know, a cymbal player and a bass drum player and a tuba, mm-hmm. and they were all just playing together. That was in New Orleans. So I would answer your question by saying, yes, jazz has its roots there. However, because I define black music as a reflection of where black folks are at any period in time, New, or- New Orleans could not have been the only place that had this. I agree with you. So Harvard says New Orleans was it. Tyrone, who has no degrees in music, <laughs> says oh, it was probably happening elsewhere too, you know, Uh huh. elsewhere in a, in a country. And that would make sense Absolutely. too, because you have music everywhere, not Absolutely. just in one location. Absolutely. So after the jazz area, was there ragtime or did that come before jazz? Well, again, I have to go back to this phrase that our music is just a reflection of the time. So mm-hmm. uh, when you had the New Orleans music, the Dixieland, you know, kind of thing, right after the Civil War, maybe just before during Reconstruction, you had this ragtime music, mm-hmm. which was more of blacks trying to show white folks that they could play classical music. Scott mm-hmm. Joplin, who actually wrote his own opera, mm-hmm. right, Desdemona, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he, he could play anything classically trained. I'm not sure. I never, I've never heard a recording of Scott Joplin 
playing in a juke joint some blues. Mm -hmm. But he probably could. Now, I'm saying all that to say that this is also not a linear thing. We don't have Dixieland, Ragtime, uh, Chicago Jazz, mm -hmm. Swing, you know, juke. We don't, it, musicologists have to have a linear path like that. Ah. But it's just like talking right now in 2015. Are we going to say that the music of the day for black folks was rap music? I know. No, we got a lot of different things happening all mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I suggested that happened at the end of the Civil War. That's a long answer to your short question. Mm -hmm. But it was probably a lot of different styles happening mm -hmm. at the end of the Civil War, not going from Dixieland to Ragtime. Mm -hmm. I don't know all the different styles, mm -hmm. but I know the black church was still happening. Yes, and then is this when they introduced musical instruments during this time period? Oh, no, 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 no. Musical instruments were here. You had, um, what's the, there's a movie out with this brother who was a classically trained violinist. Yeah, and, I know what you're uh, about. Yeah, I forget the name of the movie, but no, a lot of these instruments have their, um, you know, their, their history in Africa anyway. Mm -hmm, Not mm -hmm, all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but, you know, the piano, for example, is really a percussive instrument because the way you make sound is by hitting, striking a huh. string. And if you've ever seen an African play a kora, which is a bold instrument with a gourd, and they hit it with a string, just like, it's like taking a guitar, but the guitar would have a, a gourd on the back, and they hit the strings, and they make sound. So it almost looks like a, a person playing an upright bass, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they're using a, a stick to hit the string to make sounds, you know. So an argument could be made that a lot of these instruments have their roots in Africa. So huh. I suggest a lot of the slaves still kept Africa in their heart and in their mind. Huh. And with that said, let's take a break and we'll come back, okay? Cool. cool. And talk some more about this. All right. Because I think you got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Hi, and welcome back to the Bandy. I'm your host, Cynthia Thompson. I'm here with Tyrone. And oh my God, you have really opened my eyes to some things that I knew, but I sort of forgot. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you're here to remind me Good. how rich our music is and Absolutely. how it has impacted music here in America. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about the Civil War, Reconstruction. Let's talk about the 40s, 50s. What kind of music was going on during that time period? A big band swing was mm -hmm. probably still in its heyday. Now, I, I have this phrase that everything has a predecessor event. So before I jump from, let's say, Reconstruction to the 40s, uh -huh. we, we, we want to give credit to a young man named Louis Armstrong. Ah, uh, um, yes. And, and I always have to say this because when I was a kid in the 50s, I saw Louis Armstrong play on the Ed Sullivan show. And at that early age, I thought he was just a, a colored man with uh, like an Uncle Tom. I, I, I have to tell the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, That's what mm -hmm, I thought. Mm -hmm. I saw him smiling a lot with the big eyes and mm -hmm, playing mm -hmm. the trumpet with the white handkerchief. And not until I started studying what this brother did for music, his phrasing, mm -hmm. his uh, articulation. Big bands stole his phrasing. Fletcher Henderson is, her, huh. is, is, I think is, the story goes, Fletcher Henderson, who was actually an arranger for Benny Goodman. So when people say Benny Goodman was the king of swing, I say, well, who's writing the music? Fletcher Henderson. Well, where did Fletcher Henderson get his jip from? Well, he heard Louis Armstrong playing one time and said, hey, man, that's swinging. Uh -huh. I don't know what you cats are doing, but that's swinging. Uh -huh. Louis Armstrong, he's, he's really the master of everything that came after him. Uh -huh. So born in 1900, playing the trumpet in New Orleans, goes up to Chicago, joins King Oliver, becomes a smash hit. So now the kid just sort of uh, becomes more popular than the star. King Oliver was the star. Mm -hmm. But Louis Armstrong, a young man, was just killing everybody. Goes to New York, Chicago, St. Louis, all these places. He becomes Mr. Jazz uh -huh. for around the 1920s. 1930s, big bands start coming in. Louis Armstrong is still strong, making all these big bands just really, really swing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. A big band has to have a good lead trumpet. That's how you determine if you have a good big band. A good, oh. solid lead trumpet screaming all night long. And Louis Armstrong could do that. Were there any other instruments that could be the lead beside the trumpet? N not for my money, not in a big band. Oh. No. <laughs> now, you, can have, you, can, you have to have a good sax section, uh -huh, uh -huh. saxophone section, but for a big band, you got to have, for me, 
a slamming trumpet section. Mm -hmm. That's just it's a personal thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have it. Now, to answer your question, uh, and I wanted to talk, before I try to answer your question about the 40s, I had to kind of go back and bring us up to the Big Ben era. And so, we needed to hear that, too, so thank you very cool. much. So now, in the 40s, you still had bands, you know, Basie Band, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Jay McShann, all these cats had big bands. A lot of the, the arrangements were still based on the style of the way Louis Armstrong played. Uh huh. And But now you also had starting in the 20s. You had white bands who said, oh, we can swing just as much as black folks. But wasn't not, true. Uh, <laughs> wasn't true. Because, you know, uh, Paul Whiteman had an all, all white band. It's funny, Paul Whiteman. Huh. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Play words. Huh? I know, right? But that was his name. So, uh, but he was sort of like the Lawrence Welk of the 20s. Uh huh. So the band was nice, very accurate, but it just didn't make you bob your head and pat your feet, you know? Uh -huh. Now, other cats had bands where the musicians were just as accomplished, black. But because of segregation back then, we didn't get the credit, they didn't get the credit they were due. You know, white folks who went to conservatories and, you know, could read music and all that kind of stuff, they, they were held as being the ones who were the great bands of the day. Mm. And some of them really were, were good. You know, mm -hmm. Gene Krupp and his band, Benny Goodman, even though he had Fletcher Henderson and some other cats writing, it had, but it, Benny Goodman was one of the first guys to integrate his band. I think Teddy Wilson on piano, um, uh, I think Billy, uh, Billy, Billy Holiday sung with him, you know. So he did some very good things. Uh -huh. um, but um, black folks are the ones that just kept this music going in the 40s and 50s, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then after the big bands, uh, bebop started coming in, but that was a change in the styles of music. Louis Armstrong didn't like it at all. Mm. Dizzy Gillespie, who's a student, of the people that learned from Louis Armstrong uh, was playing all these notes that really weren't part of the regular scale. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. classical musicians say, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, di, do. Right. Dizzy Gillespie was doing, ba, be, do, ve, ba, and people were saying, wait a minute. That's, that doesn't that make doesn't sense. Sound, no, that doesn't make me swing. Mm -hmm. But there's a history to that, too, that's economic-based. Club owners oh. realized they could make more money. See, we used to have a juke joint. You go into the room, you had a floor clear like this, and everybody just started dancing. You sell your liquor. Everybody have a good time. You say, wait a minute. If we bring in this other kind of music, I can replace the dance floor with tables and get everybody at the table to buy drinks. Mm. I can make more money. People don't have to dance. They just listen to the band, you know, raise the money. You buy uh -huh. your liquor, you know, make more money that way. So they took away, I think, cabaret, cabaret laws were implemented that sort of got rid of people dancing on the dance floor. You know, you just come listen to uh -huh. bebop. So people don't dance to bebop. They just listen. Yeah, you do just listen you to yeah, that. Yeah, but sometimes it's like hard to listen to for some people. <laughs> and sit still. And sit still. Because there's some bebop folks I can't listen to. And what time period was this bebop music? I think, and then I have to go back to my records, at the end of the Big band era. Bebop must have come in maybe around the, the 40s, in mm -hmm, the late 40s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. early 50s. And black folks had different styles of music happening at the same time. Now, you know. Oh, that is right. Yeah. So, you know, rock and roll was still happening when bebop was happening. Uh huh. Like I said, we, didn't, we weren't a monolithic kind of folks. You know, we, we had a lot of different things going at the same time. Well, and that's the way we are right now. Exactly too. right. So, who really created rock and roll music? Well, now you have you different people. I don't know a name, but you know, it definitely came out of the black folks' camp. Uh huh. The Big Maybell, Louis Jordan. In uh -huh. fact, James Brown, again, everybody, everything has a predecessor event. James Brown credits Louis Armstrong. Because if you ask James Brown, where did you get your thing from? Now, the movie that came out makes it sound like he listened to Little Richard and people like that. But he says he listened to Louis Jordan. He wanted to be able to sing uh -huh. and play instruments like Louis Jordan. Uh huh. Because that band was hot. That band mm. was hot. They were still doing juke joints. Uh -huh. And they could play. And Louis Jordan is the one that was able to not be so comedic. Like, um, what's the brother that does Heidi, Heidi, Heidi Cap Calloway? Uh -huh, Cap uh -huh. Calloway had a nice band, but it was still sort of with black folks showing the big eyes and dancing, and he'd get the little process and do his hair like that. You, uh -huh, know, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, there has to be a balance between artistry and being funny. And sometimes back in those days, when a black man was showing big eyes and shaking his hair with a process, that wasn't funny. 
Not to us. Not to us. That's right. Mm -hmm. But now if you could play, you know, it didn't matter what you look like. Like Charlie Parker could play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He wasn't really trying to dance and smile. Mm -hmm, Dizzy mm -hmm, Gillespie mm -hmm. could play. Louis Armstrong could. These are the guys oh, yes. that kept the music going, you know, because they didn't have like an act. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think James Brown, too, he, he was a very talented brother. And he didn't have to do a lot of things like commercial things to be successful. He was a very talented, not a great singer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I think a genius musically. He wasn't. Mm -hmm. He didn't play very many instruments well as well. Either. Uh huh. But he came up with all these great ideas. He had a good ear. He had a very good ear, and he had to communicate to people like me or Pee Wee Ellis or Fred Wesley, who could communicate uh -huh. his grunts into something that's musical. You know, let's take a break. I'm sorry to do this. That's cool. And when we come back, we're gonna jump to the '60s, okay. the '70s, up into the present day. Cool. Okay. Good. Then this Tyrone. <laughs> I cannot believe how much information you have stored up there All in lies. your head about, <laughs> about music. <laughs> I am so glad that you're here because there's so many things that we don't know as about music today. Mm -hmm. And before we close the show, and I'm so sorry we have run out of time, what are your thoughts about the history of our music as it pertains to where we are right now with music? Mm. Mm. Short answer. Short answer. It's a hype. Excuse me? It's all right. It's just all right. It's just all right. I think a lot of these young brothers have not done their history on mass. Mm. A few have. I don't, know, I don't know the names of the rap artists that understand their history, but they're not the majority. Mm -hmm. Record companies still make their money if a black person is a thug mm. and women are bees mm. and the N-word is prevalent. You know, so I have a lot of rap about that. That's really sad. You must come back. I will. Because I have a lot more questions for you. Okay, cool. You must come back. I will. And I want to thank each and every one of you for watching my show, A Better You, here on Public Access 21, every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.